My name is Muhammad Ali, and I'm a petroleum engineer in development stage at Sudabit Oil Company. And I will be your uh, moderator for today's session. Today's webinar will be introduced, will be introduced by Mr. Mohtaz Tahir. He was a petrophysicist uh, at Sudabit uh, Company Limited in Sudan for one year, from 2001 to 2005. And after one year, he has uh, spent about one year as a, also as a petrophysicist in the Petrodar operating company in Sudan. After that, for uh, for seven years, he became a senior petrophysicist at Sudabit Oil Company. Then he transferred to Petrod as a senior petrophysicist at SDS from 2013 to 2014 and 18. After that, he became a senior petrophysicist at Tulip Oil in Netherlands and Germany for, from 2018 at current time. Please drop your questions and they will be answered after ending of the presentation. So welcome Mr. Motes and the platform is yours. Okay, uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, Petro Nile for having me today and uh, good day to you all and I hope you all are doing well during this uh, COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, so just uh, in this uh, session, I'm going to give like just a brief uh, introduction about the petrophysics uh, and this is uh, mainly intended for uh, the people who just like are fresh graduates and they have planned to uh, join oil and gas industry and also just uh, to, or to know about the petrophysics and also for the people from the other uh, uh, disciplines in the oil and gas and they wanted to know just more about the petrophysics. So what uh, you should expect in this uh, session today, just uh, it would be about the role of the petrophysics in the exploration and production, you know, that what the petrophysicist uh, does and what uh, kind of information that the petrophysicist uh, provide for the exploration and production, uh, and production. And also I will talk, you know, that about some uh, petrophysical uh, principles and concepts, the uh, essential principles like uh, prosody, permeability, uh, water saturation, and like also, you know, that at the end also I will discuss one of the most important uh, principles in the petrophysics. M most of the people, you know, that they, they don't uh, focus on. Uh, and sometimes, you know, that because like just, you know, that it, it has a conflict between the petrophysicist and the reservoir engineer. Sometimes, you know, that some people, they consider it like it's part of the reservoir engineering work or it's, it's part of the petrophysics work. So that's why it's like missing. But this is really very important uh, uh, concept to be discussed, you know, that for the, in, in the petrophysics, which is the capillary pressure. So at the end of the slides, I, I will also be discussing and explaining this uh, important concept. And at the, the end, also, I will uh, just highlight some uh, uh, information about the borehole environment as the introduction for the interpretation. Because unfortunately, in this session, I think you know that the time will not be sufficient to uh, go to the interpretation or even the quick look interpretation. Maybe just we need also just uh, like uh, another session to discuss that. Uh, okay. So for the petrophysics, what is the petrophysics? Uh, in the, the simple definition for the petrophysics is like, like it's just like a study of the rock properties and their interaction with the fluids. So here just we, as we know, just we record the locks. And I think this was explained the principles and the mechanism of the locks. It was explained in the previous uh, webinar. Uh, so we record the uh, locks in, in the well. So just we are using the kind of variety of uh, different uh, principles of physics. And this principle, it has to be interpreted to obtain the, uh, the rock and the fluid properties. And the main uh, principles of the physics that we use during the logging and it, uh, to be interpreted or converted to the useful information is the resistivity, uh, nuclear, uh, acoustic nuclear magnetic resonance and also we use like uh, sampling. At the end of the day, we the petrophysicist needs to interpret all these responses after it has been recorded uh, in the well to give useful information or to convert it to useful uh, information to be used like in uh, further on. 
So one of the information that we need is the rock type, the prosody, permeability, fluid type, fluid volume, formation, top structure, and so on. So all this, you know that it has to be interpreted just only from uh, this uh, measurement or this uh, recorded measurement uh, via wireline or LWD or, or whatever. So this is the main uh, role or task of the petrophysicist is just to interpret all this uh, uh, recorded measurement to give like a useful uh, information on the uh, rock properties. Uh, the role of the petrophysicist in the subsurface or in the oil and gas companies, and this is really very important because the petrophysics is not like a stand alone uh, discipline. So as you see here, the petrophysics is just like a beating heart in the body. So just keep bumping the blood to the whole body. And also here we keep the petrophysicists, they keep providing the information to the all other disciplines in the oil and gas for the subsurface, I mean, for the exploration and development and production. And as we see here, all the, the petrophysics is connected with all these disciplines. So they cannot work without the petrophysicists. So they need the information from the petrophysics uh, discipline to get their work done. So the petrophysics is, uh, the petrophysicist provides the information for the geologists for uh, like for making uh, the geological model or what we call it a static model. So for this, they need prosody, mobility, saturation, height, net, uh, net bay, and the fluid contact. So they get all this information to, to, to build the static or to build their model. So they need it from the vitrophysics. So you know that without the vitrophysics, this job cannot be done. And also is connected with the geophysics, the work of the vitrophysics. So the, uh, the geophysics needs also some data and information from the vitrophysics. And also this is important for the rock physics and the gas mine substitution. For the gas mine substitution, for, for example, they need like a, a kind of the geomechanical, uh, geomechanical uh, properties. Also, this is, has to be calculated or estimated by the vitrophysicists like the bulk modulus or young modulus or Poison ratio and so on. So, also, we have like you know that also so, uh, strong connection with the geologist and geophysicist, and also with reservoir engineer because also they need to uh, just uh, build their uh, dynamic model. So, and this dynamic model it comes also from the static model from the geologist, which is also comes the data it comes from the petrophysics in addition to other data it comes also directly from the petrophysics like the capillary pressure data for saturation height and also permeability data and relative permeability data. And also we see the petrophysics providing data for the geomechanics uh, domain or departments or people also they need data from the petrophysics and also the production technologies they need data from the petrophysics and the drilling, they need data from petrophysics. And eventually it has also very important uh, commercial aspects because at the end of the day, all this information, it has to go directly to make a, like a commercial decision in the final uh, reserve estimation because all this, it goes finally to uh, estimate the reserve and then you know that it has like, you know, that very strong commercial aspect. So we see like, you know, that for those people who are interested in the petrophysics, we see it's really, you know, that, you know, that like, you know, that uh, kind of uh, very interdisciplinary uh, work. So it's very connected with all other disciplines. So you, you cannot work alone. So you, you are work mostly with all other people in the subsurface world in, in the oil and gas. So nowadays also, if I come to the petrophysics aspects and branches, this is really very important because in the old days, the petrophysics, it was considered like just log analysis, which it means like just for some people, they interpret the logs and get the saturation, shell volume and porosity and that is it. But nowadays it's really, you know, that this, uh, the petrophysics uh, domain is expanding. And so we have different and many branches under the petrophysics and it has to, you, you need certain skills and uh, good knowledge for each branch branch of this uh, uh, petrophysics aspect. So I will uh, just uh, mention some of them. And here, like, for example, just I order them, like, you know, that's from the simple to difficult. So here, if I you see, you know, that as if you want to be a petrophysicist, then you need to know about the clastic reservoir petrophysics. And inside the uh, clastic reservoir petrophysics or below the clastic reservoir petrophysics, we can see different type of 
uh, level of the uh, petrophysical evaluation, you need to get knowledge of that. You know that to be like a skill, a skillful uh, petrophysicist to do the the uh, the job uh, well. So you need to know about the clean sand reservoir. This is a simple type of reservoir, so which is easy and straightforward in in terms of the petrophysical evaluation. Then you know that it will get uh, just a bit harder for the shale sand when the reservoir is not clean and you have the shale. So this is another step of the evaluation which is need also require uh, certain uh, skills and experience and knowledge and after that we go to the uh, bit more harder or difficult one you know that in the evaluation which is seen bed or laminated sand reservoir and which is require also you know that kind of certain and special skills you know that to do this kind of evaluation and and there also classic reservoir also we have time sand reservoir which is required also which is also different you know that in terms of the evaluation rather than the same bed and shale sand and clean sand reservoir so each of these you know that it has different way to be interpreted in terms of the metaphysical evaluation so that's why it's not straightforward and it and so it requires you know, that kind of uh, skills and knowledge and after that you know that as a petrophysicist you need to know about the carbonate reservoir uh petrophysics which is really also big uh, topic and big really big topic this uh, carbonate reservoir petrophysics so that's why you know that is, is split it up and separated from the classic reservoir because also here in, for the carbonate reservoir it's really the evaluation is, is uh, mostly you know that usually is different from the classic reservoir and under the carbonate reservoir also it can be divided like for the time even it could be harder in terms of the evaluation for the tide and fracture carbonate reservoir and also there is a big topic or a nice topic also connected to the carbonate uh, interpretation, which is belong to the petrophysicist, which is what we call it rock typing. And rock typing also nowadays is a, is a big topic and also is connected like to the recent uh, uh, knowledge, like uh, what we call it uh, uh, artificial intelligence and using neural network or artificial intelligence. And of course, also using the core data from to, 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 do, to do this work. And after that, we have this uh, uh, branch of the petrophysics, what we call it the unconventional reservoir petrophysics. And this is really another big topic. And also we can see it is not very common because now it's established in the North uh, America and in Canada. So, you know, that is there is really, you know, that is, is has playing a big role there. But this unconventional reservoir petrophysics, it needs like, you know, that also different knowledge than this uh, other two branches because here in the unconventional reservoir petrophysics like in addition to normal or conventional petrophysics knowledge we need here also to know a lot you know that you need high experience about the mineralogy and also about the geochemistry because also you need to know about the toc and the kerogene kerogene and how to estimate them and how to calculate them and also you need to know about the I, uh, uh, isotherm and how to calculate the free gas and absorb gas that connected to the kerogen or that connected to the uh, total organic carbon. So, so that's why it is a kind of uh, different from these other topics. And also it requires really also good knowledge about the geomechanics here for this unconventional reservoir because what we call it reservoir here in the classic reservoir here, just we mainly deal with sand. So the shell or clay is eliminated out or is considered like non-reservoir in this, uh, when we talk about the classic reservoir. And here in the unconventional reservoir, uh, uh, instead of the dealing with the sand reservoir here, we deal with the shell as the reservoir, which is so that's why it's required like, you know, that the good knowledge of the mineralogy, because here we need to know each kind of mineralogy inside the shell itself, because the shell is kind of like a, 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 a junk. Uh, trash junk. So you know that it could, you could find any anything or any minerals inside this uh, trash, like you know that quartz or feldspar or cedrite, ankerite or clay types like mentomonolite, kaolinite, elite. So all, all, all these things, you know, that's what could be in, inside the shell. So that's why the shell it has to be broken down, you know, for the mineralogy then to to uh, uh, estimate the porosity and the permeability in the right way and, and eventually the water uh, saturation. 
And also one, one type of uh, the unconventional reservoir is the fractured basement uh, reservoir also, which is really, you know, that also another type. And nowadays also we have this uh, geothermal reservoir petrophysics, another branch in the petrophysics, because here in Europe, they started to drill this uh, geothermal uh, wells to produce the uh, hot water for heating for like, you know, that just house heating and for the farm heating and also for gen generating power and electricity. So this is now the new branches in introduced, was introduced for the petrophysics also, you, we, you need to know about this. And then we have another big topic and big branch in the petrophysics, what we call it rock physics and geomechanics. And uh, the last thing here also I would, you know, that which is kind of, of connected with the petrophysics is the geosteering because you know that why when you drill the horizontal well, you need to know more about the locks and the petrophysics. So here yeah, this is, as, as we see now, the petrophysics as a branch or as a like aspects is really uh, keep, you know, that expanding more and more and more and through even more skills and knowledge. So now let's see about just uh, a little bit about the petrophysical data and the petrophysical uh, scene. So also as a petrophysicist, you have to deal with uh, different type of data and this data also it has different type of scales. So as you see here, the scale it ranges from micron 200 meters. So for a micron, for example, from the petrography data and then from core data, which is the blocks in centimeters scale. And then we have the locks in centimeter or foot, foot or meters scale. And then we have the borehole geophysics in meters scale and the seismic data in hundreds of meters scale. And then as the petrophysicist, you need to integrate and combine all this data with different scale, which is require also the kind of caution, you know, that you, you, you integrate all this data with different uh, type of scales. Uh, one of the major tasks for the petrophysicist, and I think I touched this, you know, that in the previous slide, is building like what we call it the reservoir model or in the oil and gas industry, they call it the static model or dynamic model. The static model, which is like a reservoir description, 3D geological model description, and which is used for the volumetrics uh, estimation to estimate, you know, that how much hydrocarbon do you have? And also they need it for like uh, developing the field, uh, drilling new wells, so you need to distribute it in the field. And also you need it like for the history match and production uh, forecast from the dynamic model from reservoir engineer. So at the end of the day, each uh, operating company or each uh, company, they need to build this static model and dynamic model for each producing field. And we can see now the contribution of the petrophysicist in this model, because this is what we call it like multidisciplinary uh, model or work. So for to build this model, we need like uh, geologists, geophysicists, um, petrophysicists, um, production engineer, and reservoir engineer to, to, to get this static and dynamic model. And the contribution of this, the petrophysics, you can see it in here. So it's contributing for both model static and dynamic, you know that, uh, and, and dynamic model uh, significantly. So the role of the petrophysics really for reservoir modeling is really significant. And if you are not, you know that, uh, uh, work, you know, that doing well, or just, you know, that without drug decisions and all this model, it will be like, you know, that uh, uh, not accurate model, depending on the data coming from the petrophysics, because like, you know, that we are, they are receiving the data from scratch from the petrophysics and the geophysics also uh, domain. And here now I will talk a little bit also about the physical data and sources. And here I listed the main uh, data sources for the petrophysics uh, work. So as a petrophysicist, you need to get the, uh, to, to integrate the all available data that you receive from the field. And normally as a petrophysicist, we start the work with uh, what we call it mud log or the master log. Uh, collected from the field. And this master log and mud log is including drilling data, and which is really very important data are uh, including uh, rate of penetration and weight of bit, 
cutting description, percentage, hydrocarbon shows, uh, infrared geological column, which you, what we call it also the formation tops. So as a petrophysicist, firstly, you know that before to go anywhere or before to start any interpretation, you need to look carefully at the mod logs because this, all the data here, it has to be integrated with the interpretation of the logs because for example, if you look at the cutting the description here, because you need to know what kind of minerals that you have in the formation, because sometimes uh, until you get you get the petrography from the core, you can get some mineral description here, or if there is the presence of some uh, like uh, heavy minerals like uh, pyrite or uh, like ions or siderite or something like this. So you need to consider this in the interpretation because this one, this uh, the presence of this mineral will uh, influence the response of the logs. So that's why you know that you need to look here first. And also for the hydrocarbon interval, you need to, you need to look at the hydrocarbon shows because sometimes you know that you can miss the hydrocarbon interval from, from logs. So you need to combine all this data together with the logs interpretation. The other uh, important piece of data is the core data. And this is what we call it the ground truth because the core data is the only ground truth data that you can get. And why we call it like this? Because the uh, uh, locks uh, themselves, uh, you need to use the empirical equation to get uh, uh, all the properties out of them. But from the core, this is like a kind of the direct measurement. And also you can see, you know, that the ground in front of you. So for all the interpretation, we need to calibrate with core. So that's why the course is really, you know, that very important or the most important piece of the information that we have. And for the core, we have like uh, two types of core. We have the drill core. This is the normal core that we drill in the wells. And also we have the side wall core. This is can be uh, uh, acquired uh, via, the, via the wire lines. And uh, the important also, and this is a famous thing for the petrophysicist, you know, that dealing with is the open hole locks, which is including the wireline locks. And nowadays also we have the wild, uh, wild, wild drilling locks or what we call it, uh, logging wild drilling L L LWD. And also after uh, the production, and also, you know, that for the case hole, we can use the case hole locks during the production or also after production or the before production, if we need some information. So we can use some data from the case hole logs. And one of the most important downhole uh, data is the pressure measurement. This is also, we can do it uh, via the wire line or LWD. And finally, the borehole seismic like the VSP data. So as a petrophysicist, so you normally, you know that we will uh, work with uh, all this uh, data and you need to integrate them all. And here, just uh, from all this data here, I will put the core data because as I mentioned, this is the most important uh, uh, data that we can get and what we call it the uh, ground, ground truth. And from the core data, we can see it here. This is like the core data uh, from core. And from this core data, you can get either uh, horizontal blocks or vertical blocks. And from this horizontal or vertical blocks, you can get all this information to be integrated with the locks interpretation. So at the end of the day, the picture at least will be complete when you have all, when you get all this information from core to calibrate your locks and also to integrate it with with the locks. And what we call, what we get from the core. As the basic information, we have the basic rock uh, properties like porosity, permeability, and grain density. Uh, we need this data to calibrate uh, the locks interpretation because also, as I mentioned, we can get them from the locks, but using the empirical equation from locks like sonic or neutron or density. And also, we need to get the permeability. And as we know here, the permeability is never ever uh, measured from the field directly because even even these days they say that like you know that the NMR measured the permeability, permeability directly but not measure it not measured uh, directly from the locks because you have to uh, use uh, some empirical uh, algorithm to, to get the permeability. Uh, then we need to process and permeability cross plot to get like you know that uh, the the permeability and we need to to use them for the calibration with the lock interpretation. 
Other uh, important information here, the saturation from the capillary pressure. And this is really also very important data. We need it for building saturation height function and the distribution for the saturation in the field. And also this is uh, data, another in, uh, data electrical properties, M and N, which is used for the saturation equation from Archie and cation exchange capacity also we need this if you are using like uh, dual water equation or uh, uh, Johas equation or so, so 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 for this equation is really you know that uh, very 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 important the cation exchange capacity in the presence of shell so this data is really very important to correct for the shellness uh, yeah. Uh, impact in, in the reservoir and to get like, you know, that just uh, appropriate or accurate uh, water saturation. And also we have the acoustic properties from core measured and also from the core, we can get the fascies and mineral and diagenesis and clay typings, the positional and formation age and all the petrography data. So the, the core is real, you know, that's very useful for the petrophysicist. So just as like, you know, that the backbone of, uh, of our work, you know, that to have the core data. Some people just say, they think that the petrophysicist, they need to rely on only on locks. But I think the, the core data is really the backbone for the work, you know, for, for, for the integration and the calibration and now we come to we come to locks so what do we get from locks so all this uh, uh, as we see here you know that if we have the oil field and reservoir containing water oil and gas and it's just like uh, recorded via the wire line locks here normally we get like what we call it uh, the conventional locks like uh, gamma ray or density neutron and and resistivity, but also getting these logs is different. Is uh, you know that is different from uh, from well to well or from field to field because it uh, it depends on the what type of wells and what type of um, of information that you need together because you cannot just uh, get the all. Uh, locks and all the information at the same time. It could be different from well to another well. For example, in the exploration well, you need to lock all the important and uh, complete data set of locks to evaluate the wealth. And if you go further in the development, then maybe you can just uh, reduce the number of, lo of locks that you need in the field because just to reduce the cost and also because now you know your uh, field uh, better. And after we lock the well, this is a measure or important information that we get from locks, like the depths and permeable information. And here also, as you see here, it's mentioned like permeable information, not permeability, because as I mentioned, you cannot get the permeability directly from uh, from locks, but you know that you can infer the permeable uh, formation from locks, like you know that if you have the invasion in resistivity or from caliber, if you have mud cake or from NMR, for example, you can see it as a movable hydrocarbon. So, so this kind of or from SP deflection, so you can get the you, you can find the indication for the permeable formation, but you cannot measure the permeability directly from locks. And also we have another important uh, property, we can get it from locks like prosody, thickness of reservoir, uh, net sand and net bay. And sorry if I'm fast because you know that I need just, you know, that to, to finish uh, the presentation on time. So we have net sand and net bay and also I'm going to discuss all this term later. Uh, subsurface uh, pressure, fluid phase, uh, gas and oil and water, fluid saturation, movable hydrocarbon, depths of the uh, formation. And lithology, velocity, seismic and correlation. And by the way, the, the most important measurement, because some people, they think it could be a process or permeability, but the most important measurement is the depth, you know, the from blocks, because you need to know the depth exactly. If the depth is, if the depth is wrong, so all the, this measurement is useless. Uh, here now, this is the one of the most important uh, equation here in uh, the oil and gas industry, the reserve estimation equation. Uh, to estimate your how much hydrocarbon do you have in the field. And we can see the contribution of the petrophysicist to get this uh, estimation because this, I think this is the end of the, like the field evaluation to get this number. And this is number is very important for the management and big bosses. So we can see for this equation, we have the GRV, the gross uh, rock volume. This we get it from the uh, geophysicist and uh, the, rock, uh, the gross, uh, the gross uh, rock we get it from geologist and the net uh, 
from petrophysis, porosity from petrophysis, water saturation from petrophysis, and reservoir engineering from it's providing this uh, formation volume factor. So we can see also the contribution for the petrophysicist in calculating the reserve. One of the important uh, also aspects in uh, also uh, one of the important uh, uh, terms uh, for the petrophysics and you will uh, see it, you know that frequently is what we call it equivalent hydrocarbon column and this it depends on the how much uh, net uh, reservoir do you have. Uh, so, for example, if we have uh, the field, this is the uh, reservoir contour map, and we have the well drilled here, and this is the cross section of the wells, is just penetrating shale, sand, shale, sand. And if we put it here in this diagram, we can see the well with shale, sand, shale, sand. And then uh, we need to calculate how much net sand we, we have, because this is the producing, it will be the producing hydrocarbon. So we need to calculate how much net reservoir we have. So at least here, for example, here we have five meter net reservoir. And by multiplying this net uh, sand with the porosity, we will get what we call it uh, bore volume, hydrocarbon times porosity. And by multiplying this with the saturation, uh, uh, hydrocarbon saturation, we will get what we call it uh, equivalent hydrocarbon column. You know that how many meters that we have is just uh, occupied by uh, or filled by hydrocarbon. So in this case here is one meter. So now we can see here we have net uh, five, like five meter uh, net sand, this uh, sand here and this sand here. But sometimes the sand itself, it cannot be like, you know, that it's just like it's not uh, the whole net sand because sometimes part of the sand, it could be highly cemented. And then, you know, that as a sand itself, it's not like contributing in the production. So even for the sand itself, sometimes part of it, it will be treated as a non-reservoir. Non and I'm going to discuss this uh, later also. So now one of the important uh, definition here in the, for the petrophysics, uh, I mean concept is the net, uh, what we call it net uh, reservoir and net bay. So for the net reservoir, net reservoir rock has a storage uh, ca capacity. So this is what we, what we call it uh, porosity. So for, for the net reservoir, we need the, the reservoir to be bored so what, uh, and then it has some kind of storage capacity. And also it has to be permeable and what we call it also, you know, that it has like kind of the flow capacity. So for the reservoir to call it net, it has to have the storage capacity and flow capacity. So the flow, the storage capacity itself is not enough. And then it has to be storage and the flow capacity. So that's why, you know, that the part of the sand sometimes if it's not contributing and if it has not this kind of the flow capacity because of the cementation, even if it is sand, then it will not be considered as a reservoir. So uh, what, uh, one of the other definition also for important uh, principles and concepts for the petrophysicist is the cutoff criteria. Because the cutoff criteria, this is what we use to discriminate between what is net reservoir and non-reservoir. Uh, and this uh, cutoff criteria, it could be the porosity, shale content, or it could be water saturation or uh, permeability or any uh, things else. But uh, this is one of the debatable also concept in the oil and gas. So you will find uh, so many papers published, you know, that to how uh, define the cutoff and how to infer the cutoff uh, for, to, to discriminate the reserve, net reservoir and non-reservoir. Non, non and also for the reservoir rocks, mainly they are sandstone, limestone, and dolomite. This is what we call it like typical reservoir, but also as I mentioned earlier, also the shell, it could be a reservoir these days for, for gas. And for the cap rock or non-reservoir, that's the typical rocks are shells and evaporites. So I will come to the porosity, one of the important definition also, um, important concept uh, for the petrophysicist is the uh, porosity. So if we have the rock cubes like here, so this brown, we can, uh, they are the grains. And in between we have this uh, bore space in, in blue. So the porosity just, you know, the, the simple definition for it is just uh, like uh, the bore uh, volume divided by the bulk volume. So if we convert this like uh, uh, to volume, the grain, uh, the, the, uh, the grains of the rock. 
So we have it in brown here, and for the bars volume, we have it in blue here. So if we divide below by the bulk volume, then we will get the porosity. And the porosity all the time is uh, expressed in the fraction for, for the equation. So it, it can be expressed in the fraction or in the unit. But you know that when you use them in the equation for the water saturation and for the, all the other equation, it has to be expressed in, in fraction. But you can see it sometimes in fraction or you can see it in, in percentage. So now we will come to the porosity definition. And this is, by the way, this is really very, 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 very important uh, uh, sketch or diagram. You need to understand it very well. It's really very, very important because sometimes people, you know, that they mix or uh, got confused uh, to understand this uh, concept. So here, to understand the prosthetic types, here we have in this uh, diagram, we have just we assume that we have uh, a rock reservoir or we have a rock cube. In this rock, we have uh, like the matrix, which is include quartz and clay layer. And for the clay itself, like you know that it has uh, the structural water. And also for the clay surface, in the clay surface, we have some water connected to the clay, uh, to, to, to the clay layer or the clay surface, what we call it, uh, bound water. So the clay itself, it has the water, you know, that built in like structurally. So we call it structural water. And we have it like also the, some water connected to the surface of the clay, what we call it bound water. So in the matrix, now we have quartz, we have clay, but with two types of water, structural water and bound water. And then after that, we have like bore space. So just moving from matrix here to the bore space. So in the bore space, we have like small bores. And in this small bores, we have some water connected to this small bores because of the uh, capillarity. So you know that because of the capillary pressure. So we have some water uh, like locked and uh, gelled inside this small bore. So it's not produced and it cannot go outside. So we call it capillary water. So this definition of water is really very important then because when you come to the interpretation. And after that, we have large bore. So in this large bore, either it can contain hydrocarbon or water, so or water, so whatever fluid. So it has to be hydrocarbon or water in the large bore. Then after that, we have what we call it isolated pores. This isolate bores, usually you see it in carbonates. You don't see it in the plastic much that much. So you, you see it in the carbonates. And this is what makes uh, the, the carbonate interpretation uh, complicated in, in terms of the evaluation. Because as you see here, this isolate board is part of the effective, what we call it effective porosity. Because here either we have total porosity, including the shell from here to here. So for the total porosity is including the shell and all the other bores, uh, large bores, small bores, and isolated bores. So we have total porosity. And for, for the effective porosity, we have it uh, just only, uh, it has a large bore, small bores, and isolated bores by taking out the effect of the shell or the clay. So you see here from here, this we have the shell volume. And uh, when we take this shell volume out of the total porosity, we will get this effective porosity from here to here. But the issue is that for the carbonate, because the isolated porosity sometimes is not connected, it's, it's isolated, so it's not connected to the other porosity. So it has no like flow capacity. And this is the issue. So sometimes you know that in the carbonate, you can see like high porosity, but like low permeability because this low, uh, this is the isolated porosity. It's not going to contribute in, in, in the production. And now when we come here, if, if we look at this one to see the impact of the influence of the shell in the reservoir, and in the evaluation here, if we have this matrix and the free water, if we assume here we have this uh, just a reservoir containing matrix, so say for example, quartz and bores, only bores, including uh, free water. So you can see, we can say this is like clean reservoir. And if we add shell to this system, so dry clay, then we see directly here we have some bound water connected to the clay, like as I said in here. So in the system, you will add some bound water to the system in addition to the free water in blue, and then you have the matrix. And when by increasing the clay, the bound water is increased and the free water decreases or the 
your effective porosity decrease and see by by just filling everything with clay so you will remove you will lose your all the effective porosity and it will be just only like uh, bound water so here you can see this is the effect of shale in the reservoir so by just keep increasing then you will keep losing your effective porosity and now for the process types also here we have what we call it primary porosity and secondary porosity and this is the primary porosity this is the bore formed during the original deposition this is the normal just uh porosity in the plastics you can see it is uh, just like uh, it looks like very homogeneous in the cubes and grains here and we have the secondary porosity it could be during like you know that uh, after the bores or after original uh, form after uh, original de deposition it could be due to the diagenesis or some kind of uh, dissolution and also for the porosity types here we have also another even for the effective porosity we have well, for the porosity we have uh, two uh, two other types uh, classified uh, based on the flow what we call it effective porosity and ineffective porosity and you remember i mentioned that in the in uh, isolated pores because here we you see we see all this below like as a connected pores here and if we look at this one we have in uh, effective porosity because they are not all connected together so it's kind of pore spaces in the in the rock but they are not connected and at the end of the day they will not contribute in the production and now we come to porosity types in carbonates. So that's why I said, you know, that the carbonates is the really most difficult one, you know, that for the evaluation in terms of distributing the porosity, uh, water saturation and permeability, because the porosity you cannot uh, infer it directly, you know, that and permeability and saturation from locks, you need some kind of information from the uh, cores and from like other uh, advanced locks and also from the in the description of the cuttings so here we see like uh, in uh, carbonate you can imagine you can find any type of uh, shape that of the porosity that you can imagine you can find it in carbonate like intergranular microcrystalline or crystal overgrowth or moldic so for moldic this is like it could be like uh, seashells or like uh, from an or castor boats and anything and then it has uh, dissolved, uh, dissolved by water or formation water and then it gives like kind of modic porosity and then we have brachia and we have fracture porosity and we have channel and we have vox and this vox it could be sometimes it could be connected sometimes it's not connected which makes it also even more difficult for evaluation so because of this complexity in carbonate it comes like another uh, important aspects uh, for the petrophysics what, which i mentioned it before like rock typing here i'm showing the rock timing from one of the most uh, famous uh, rock typing in the petrophysics world from lucia so we can see that uh, here it's uh, Lucia uh, classified uh, carbonate rocks to three uh, classes, class one, two, three, uh, based on the grain, uh, based on the type of the grain and the presence of uh, mud. And also if it is the carbonate rocks, uh, if the carbonate rocks, you know, that is uh, vague. So for the vax, is it uh, touching vax or separate uh, vax? So or is it, is it inter-particle uh, bores or inter-particle bores? So for this is only this class is for inter-particle bores. Uh, so we have grain dominated and mon dominated and then it's class, uh, classified to different uh, classes. So each one of this, it has like, you know, that uh, different uh, relationship with saturation and with uh, permeability. So that's why from, for the carbonate, you cannot evaluate it just directly from locks. You know that if you go to, uh, if you need the proper evaluation for the pro, uh, dyna static and dynamic model, so you need to know also about the rock typing because of the complexity of the carbonates. And as I, I can skip this one because I think just I mentioned it uh, uh, before. And then the controls on the prosody because I see that time is running. So controls of pro on prosody. So for the carbonates, uh, for the controls, we have the intergranular, it could be intergranular or intragranular or moldic or refill or uh, dolomitization. So the dolomitization, you know, one of the most important things because it is enhanced the process in the carbonate. So if you have like this kind of diagenesis because of the dolomitization, normally it's increased the uh, 
uh, prosody in the reservoir. For the sandstone, I think this is the most common one. Most of the people, they know it, the control is the, just based on the grain size, grain shape, sorting, backing, cementation, clear volume, and compaction. And I talked a little bit about the cementation because sometimes I said it could be like sandstone reservoir, but it could be highly cemented either by clay or either by carbonate mat uh, material, then e even if the reservoir is sandstone, but the permeability it will be low and it could be also process could be low. So porosity measurement. So the sources of the porosity, where, from where do we get the porosity? As I mentioned before, the core is the first uh, step to get the porosity. I mean like uh, the accurate porosity, but we, uh, from, from, from the core we get, uh, we, we measure the porosity. Either you know that they measure two of pore volume, gram volume and bulk volume. They measure two of these and they ratio, ratio them together to get the Porosity from core. So the, 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 the core process is kind of direct and, and the estimation is really you know, that very good for the uh, LOX calibration. It is, as I mentioned, direct measurement, but sometimes you know that it measures uh, total porosity or effective porosity, and this it depends on drying and the cleaning of the uh, core product blocks itself. So you need to also to uh, uh, to make sure you know that what kind of uh, porosity that you have from core is it total porosity or effective porosity for the, your locks calibration because if you use total porosity to calibrate the uh, effective porosity from locks it will not be correct and if you use the pro effective to, cal uh, to calibrate the uh, total it will not be correct so you need also to to be careful you know what type of the process that you got from core to calibrate your locks and the lux porosity, this is also, you know, that for, uh, this is uh, very common. So we, we got the uh, porosity from lux from the sonic, from the density, density neutron and NMR. And other you said, we cannot, we are not going to discuss it uh, in this uh, session today. And the porosity measured from all this uh, tools is different. So it, it, it has kind of, you know, that it differs. So it, it doesn't give like, you know, that, uh, same porosity from this tool to this tool depends on the, what kind of mineralogy and the fluid inside the reservoir because they respond to different uh, uh, thing. And no log measure porosity directly also I mentioned this because we need to use like kind of the empirical equation to get the porosity from logs and we need to core to calibrate the logs. So porosity and measuring techniques. Oh, so that's why, you know, that here, as I mentioned here, porosity is measured different. Why the process not having the same measurement or not giving the same answer? At least they give like, you know, that very close to each other, but, but not the same answer because you know that they respond differently. And that's why I will show it here in this slide. You can see this is the process calculated from sonic. So the sonic is only measure the, the primary porosity. So the, pro the sonic cannot measure the secondary porosity or, to, or what you call it, isolate porosity. So you can see here, the sonic is only respond to primary porosity. So it's re respond to the, until the large bore here. This for the sonic. If we look at the neutron, the neutron respond to the all type of the porosity, including the isolate porosity, and even more here in the clay side, because also the neutron respond to the water inside the clay, which is not uh, uh, considered here in the density log. So we can see here that the total porosity from the neutron is a bit higher than the total porosity from the density, because the density also it responds to isolate porosity. It see from here from isolate porosity until the high until to the bound water, the, uh, the water connected to the surface of the clay. So we see the neutron is seeing more clay, more uh, uh, porosity, total porosity than the density. And the sonic is sees like uh, less porosity be, um, if we, we have isolate to isolated bores or secondary bores in the system because it's only respond to the primary porosity. And this is also real, sometimes is, is useful because if we have density neutron, or if, if we have sonic locks and if we have isolated or secondary porosity, then we can infer this from this tool because just by subtracting the sonic uh, porosity from the total uh, porosity for, for each lock here, then we can get this uh, secondary porosity by subtracting this one from this one, then you can get this part from here. So it gives like a, an index or indication of the prime uh, of the secondary or isolated porosity if we have sonic and 
the other logs. For the process ranges, here we can see this is just come some kind common uh, ranges of the prosody. For the chalks is from 55 to 40 dolomites and until we reach the unconsolidated sand. But what we see it in here, you can see for the chalks, it could go up to high. This is also one of the carbonate issues. We can see it could for the chalks in carbonate, we have, it could uh, have high uh, prosody up to 40, but normally the permeability of the chalks is, is, is really low. So you see in carbonate, the Prosody is not directly connected to the permeability. So you can get high porosity, but very low permeability. Okay, for the shell distribution, here also in the, the shell, it could be distributed in the reservoir in the three main types, like it could be dispersed or laminated or uh, it's, uh, it's structural. I see time is running, so I have to go faster. And each of this uh, kind of uh, distribution is really like, you know, that it has a different uh, influence of the, in, in the bore, uh, in the bore system and also in the permeability. But one of the main things here is the clay and shell, because sometimes the people they use, you know, that like clay volume and shell volume and the people they need to know, you know, that what is the difference between the clay and, and shell. Because the clay is a min, uh, mineral term, so it's a mineralogy. When we say clay, clay is a mineralogy, but when we say shell, this is a, like a grain size, but it could contain anything, you know, that, but in very low grain size. But the clay, when we say clay, this is like another you know, clay mineral. It could be montrumalite or elite or kaolinite or something like this. But in the petrophysics, there is no difference, you know, that in, I mean in the evaluation, because you, we can see, you know, that if it's a clay volume, it, it doesn't make uh, uh, big differences because at the end of the day, just you need to estimate the clay or the shell volume and to get your effective porosity. But when you come to the shell gas, this is comes really very important because it has different minerals and you need to break them down, you know, that for the uh, accurate porosity and permeability and water saturation calculation. But there is a difference between clay and shell. This is also you need to know. And also for the permeability uh, definition, the permeability also, this is like, uh, just uh, as I said before, like this is the flow, how the easy fluid can pass through the formation. And also it depends on the grain size and the rock matrix, so it can be easy fluid flow if we have just like big uh, bar throat in here, so the fluid it can flow easily. And this is the important equation like from the Darcy law to calculate uh, the permeability from uh, blocks, core blocks. I need uh, control on the permeability. Yeah, so this is uh, one, uh, this is really very important. Yeah, I wanted to discuss also the differences between the clastics and the carbonate. Because we know the permeability is measured in core and also it could be measured in the, in the locks, but on the empirical, by using empirical equation and calibrated to, to core. But now let's see, you know, that the differences between the clastics reservoir or sandstone reservoir and the carbonate. Because in the clastic reservoir, you can see the relationship, this is one of, from the North Sea relationship, just one of the sandstone reservoir in the North Sea, you can see the relationship for different wells. And here you see the relationship in the clastic is very nice for the between the prosody and the permeability. Here we have the permeability and prosody is nice, very so you can implement this relationship directly for the evaluation or in the model. When it comes in the carbonate, we can see it here, like you have this, all this is scattered. So it's very difficult to get like a uh, a relationship, uh, nice relationship like this. So that's why you have to uh, break down uh, the reservoir to the classes and, and rock types. And we can see it here is defined by the color or is marked by the color for the red is green stone and green is back stone, back stone, back stone and blue is more dominated fabrics. And even if it is a fracture reservoir also, we can see some part of uh, blocks or measurement is falling this part in here. So it could be here, this is a fractured, uh, fractured uh, blocks or fractured uh, interval. And then we have all this uh, part of the carbonate reservoir. So to, to distribute the permeability and water saturation is very uh, complicated because you need to know your rock type and to 
assign each uh, ro uh, each equation to each uh, rock type for the permeability and the water saturation. Uh, for the water saturation uh, definition, also is one of the main term you will see in the petrophysics world is the ratio between, uh, of the bore space occupied uh, by water divided by the bore is based of the volume. And also this is very connected with the porosity types because we have two, two types of porosity, as I mentioned, either effective porosity or total porosity. And the total porosity is include the shell in the system or the bound water in the system, I mean, and the effective porosity is eliminating the bound system from, from uh, bound water from the system. It's only capillary water and the free water and, and the hydrocarbon. So uh, we have for the water saturation uh, equation, uh, one is discussed later, not in this uh, presentation, but maybe in different session. So either we use the uh, water, uh, water saturation based on the effective porosity, or either we use the water saturation based on the total porosity. Then it could be total SW or effective SW. But it's not like, you know, that it will be like one of the um, pitfall if you mix between the uh, total, bro uh, total water saturation equation and effective porosity because you know that it will be really, you will either reduce or uh, increase your, your volume. So that's why uh, one of the pitfall is not just to mix between the two system. If you use the total porosity system or uh, for the water saturation calculation, then it has to be total porosity. And if you're using the effective porosity equation for to calculate the water saturation, then it has to be effective uh, porosity. Okay, so now I'm come here to the capillary uh, pressure. So uh, I think that's how I hopefully I can do this in five uh, minutes. So in the capillary, capillary pressure, this is uh, one of the most important uh, concept in, in the petrophysics. Well, it, for example, if we are uh, drilling the well here in the crest, the, and if we are drilling another well here in down deep close to the oil water contact, so the saturation here in this interval or in this crest here is different from this, uh, uh, the well here drilled here closer to oil water contact. And if we want, so that's why we need to know about the capillary pressure, because for example, if we want to, to distribute the saturation between the well here and this well. So if we want to distribute the saturation in this part in here, how, we, how do we distribute it? Because if we take the, the average saturation between this well and this well, either this part here, it will be uh, 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 reduced or it be, it be increased. So it depends you know, that on, a, on how much uh, saturation you have it in here or and have it in here. But by knowing the capillary pressure phenomenon and, and effect, you can distribute your saturation in this uh, part of reservoir by knowing the height, even if you, you, if you don't have drilled well in this part in here. And if you look at it in here, for example, in this, you can see the saturation and this is the oil water contact in this part. So you can see here we have a high uh, hydrocarbon saturation in green. And when getting closer to the oil water contact, we see more water, more water until it became water. So this one, we can see it for, from this capillary pressure from phenomena or what we call it capillary pressure, because if we have this, uh, water uh, tubes here, pipes. So in the water uh, uh, tubes, if you have the big bore and a smaller bore and the smaller bore here, so the water is getting high, higher, getting higher and higher because of the capillary pressure effect. So for the bore, for the uh, big bores here, you can see the column of the water is lower. And when the bore reduced, then the column of the water is getting, uh, is, uh, getting higher and higher depending on the bore size. So the smaller bore size, even the, the higher water uh, column in here. And this one, it can be reflected in the uh, pressure column, the, the pressure data in here, because the pressure data is uh, measured from the field. If we plotted the pressure water gradient and the hydrocarbon gradient, the difference between the uh, water pressure, oil pressure and water pressure, this is exactly what gives us what we call it like capillary pressure. So like the, we, we have uh, this definition of the capillary pressure is the difference between the oil pressure and water pressure. And then it's, it's, it can be expressed uh, depend on the water uh, tube here based on the 
uh, interfacial uh, tension and the uh, uh, sigma or the, the angle uh, divided by the radius. And also it can be expressed based on the uh, gradient, difference in the density times the gravitational uh, uh, times the G times the height above the contact. This gives us this important uh, concept, what we call it free water level. So the free water level here you see, as I mentioned, the difference between the water pressure and the uh, oil pressure and water pressure, this gives us the definition of the capillary pressure. So we can see it is increasing when we go higher and higher and higher. When it comes here as the intersection, when we have this zero uh, capillary pressure, because if you, uh, B oil minus B water is equal to zero here. This is the definition of the free water level. So below this point, we just only we have uh, water. We don't have any hydrocarbon anymore. So you can see here at the intersection or where the BC equals zero, this is what we call is the free water level. And when we're getting higher than the free water level, we can see the capillary pressure increase. Uh, I will skip this one. And this is story, you know, that I mentioned it there it can be done in the laboratory in, inside the core flux in the scale data. So in the scale data, if we have the core flux, then we can just, you know, that we saturate it with the uh, water and this water, it can be drained by any other fluid like uh, mercury or, or oil. And then, you know, that from, this is a laboratory measurement. So we have uh, one point here the saturation is equal one is fully saturated with water. And when we apply this pressure, then the point is here. And then when we apply another pressure, then the saturation by injecting or draining the water inside the plugs by another fluid from outside, then we will get uh, another uh, saturation for higher pressure. And then we will get another injecting uh, more uh, saturation from another fluid with a uh, different pressure, then we will get another point and another point. And then by connecting all these points together, we get what we call it the capillary pressure curve, which is uh, one of the most important uh, uh, concept in the uh, petrophysics and also for the reser reservoir engineering, this one, what we call it here, the capillary pressure. So what when you plot the SW and the capillary pressure or the height, because the height it can be this uh, equation. If you if you rewrite this equation, you can get also the height from the capillary pressure because this is the BC and by arranging this one, you can get the height. So here either it could be height or it could be capillary pressure. So now, by having this saturation for each height above the free water level, we can see, you know, that if we are this, we can assume this is we are in the zero uh, free, uh, uh, we are in this uh, height in the reservoir at zero or at the free water level, 50 meter above this height, then we can get this saturation. 100 meter above this height, we can get this saturation 150. At this height, we can get this saturation 200 meter, we can get this saturation. So this is the importance of this curve. So we can use this curve to distribute the saturation across the reservoir. So now we come to the interpretation of uh, uh, we come to the interpretation of this uh, curve, the capillary pressure curve. So this is the curve as I mentioned before. Here, when we uh, uh, when we have this, uh, when we get this curve from the core data or from the lab, with this asymptotes uh, intersection with the horizontal line, we can get uh, what we call it irreducible water saturation. So this is irreducible water saturation that we have uh, in the field. And in this area of the field, just we are producing only pure hydrocarbon. Below this uh, point here, we can call it, uh, we call it transition zone. And here it could be like, you know, that you can produce a mixture between oil and, or a mixture between hydrocarbon and water. And below this uh, point here, you produce uh, free water. And also you can see it if you want to just uh, to mimic it with a well, you can see it like this. So this is the curve. And we can see here, this is the free water level. So below this point of the curve, just you are producing water. And from here to here, just we are call it transition zone, and you are producing just like a mixture of uh, water and hydrocarbon. And above this point, 
from here to here where we have this uh, symptoms in here you are just producing a, a pure hydrocarbon and uh, then uh, just you can see here this is also the different uh, how the Kabir bridger curve looks you know that when we have uh, when we got uh, different drop type because as I mentioned there in the tubes if you have big board then the capillary pressure curve you have low entry point and also you have nice and smooth and very low water saturation so if you for the good quality rocks and hypermobility you can see the reducible water saturation it will be very low here by just extending the symptoms here up to here and if you have the low water uh, if you have low quality rocks and with low permeability and low porosity so you can see your irreducible water saturation it will be higher because the water saturation is uh, increasing in this um, in this side and also the entry pressure when you inject the fluid in the in the plugs in the experiment so if you have good uh, quality rocks you can see the entry 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 pressure point is very low for the good quality reservoir and very high for the bad quality reservoir so this is the entry pressure here you can see to for the raw, low quality and here this is the entry pressure for the good quality so at the end of the day at least for this curve also you can see you know that how uh, what is your saturation that you can infer or you can find in the in the reservoir in the good quality reservoir if you have this uh, good quality then you have very low saturation here and if you have a bad quality reservoir then you will get this high irreducible water saturation in here i think i should stop here uh, today i think because now it is just uh, one hour i exceeded my time Should I reply or? Yeah, for the borehole seismic, this is really important for the, the for the geophysicists because they need it for the seismic calibration and also they need it for the time uh, depth conversion for the velocity, for the velocity model. This is the importance of borehole seismic. Yeah, but for the borehole seismic, this is very important for the seismic for the seismic interpreter or for the geophysicist because they need it for the uh, their uh, seismic uh, interpretation or seismic calibration for what we call it uh, time time to depth conversion because the time. Uh, yes, yes, of course. I cannot hear you very well. Hello? Uh, second question is how to get... I, I, I can't hear you. Hello? Hello? Hello. As we said, uh, the second question, how to get M and M parameters for Archie equation? Yeah, this is also we get it from the from the core uh, measurement because it depends you need in the core measurement you have to just uh, to measure like the saturation index and uh cementation also uh, exponent index so this is you get it from the core measurement and hopefully you know that if you have time because as i said just today i i just talk about the main concepts of the 
of the vitro physics and definition, but I didn't go deeper, you know, that to go for all the core analysis parameters and all this stuff. But normally we get it from the uh, core, core measurement. It's measured in the core. Okay. Um, uh, sir, the third question is on what pages we select our saturation model for shared sandstone as we have many models. Uh, yeah, so I think this is really a very good question because first of all, you, you get it, you know, that depends on uh, the availab availability of the data. Because uh, if you have like the cation exchange capacity data, and this is normal, you know that we don't have it from core because this is really very important data from the QV. So if you have this one, then you can go, you, you can use that total porosity equation like uh, dual water or like uh, any other like, you know, that uh, water uh, total porosity equation uh, model so it's really you know that very very powerful so it, but if you have the core data and this is usually you don't have it so if you don't have the core data like uh, cation exchange capacity or the qv uh, then maybe you can use the uh, like uh, indonesian equation from the effective process because like this is empirical equation but it's, it's, it's useful and the picking of the parameters you can do it from from locks without you know that having the core data so so it depends you know that if you have a uh, good core data then maybe you can go to the total process equations and if you don't have uh, the core data you can go to the any other empirical equation. But at the, at the end of the day, if they are all, you know, that the, the, bar, the picking of the parameters well, well big and all uh, things are all right, then, you know, that you should get like, you know, that very close uh, result to each other. Okay. Um, the last question is, are there any advanced logging techniques that can measure porosity and vulnerability directly? No. No, it's all empirical. Uh, for porosity, it's empirical, and for permeability, they are empirical. So there is no, and I mentioned this uh, in, in the presentation, there is no any direct you know, that way to measure the porosity and permeability directly. Some people, you know, that I said, you know, that, or, or the, they, they say, like, you know, that the permeability is measured directly from the NMR, but uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not, because at, at the end of the day, you need, like, also calibration from core and for this one, and also they are using. Uh, uh, equation like using the Coates equation or Taymor equation or even Schlumberger equation from the NMR. So, so at the end of the day, they are using empirical equation. It's not uh, just direct. And also for the carbonate, it has to be calibrated for core because you don't know the the border between the movable hydrocarbon and irreducible or uh, movable porosity or irreducible porosity and Kilebaum water process. So this is, has to be defined from core. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Motes, for this informative and fruitful presentation. Um, but we have also, we have, uh, we have to complete this uh, webinar at the next time, inshallah. inshallah. And uh, we hope uh, all the audience have uh, great uh, information about the introduction about the physical uh, knowledge. And we hope inshallah see you next time okay, for the thank, other webinars. Yeah, thank you very much for you. Thank, thank you very you much. much. Um, please, uh, Mr. Matas, could you save uh, the recording from you?